miss you. Oh, I miss you too. We saw each other in person. And it was really nice. We spent a whole like 24 hours together, basically. It was my favorite part of my trip home. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it was so okay. We should we should say what we did before we talk about why it was so amazing. What were we doing, Tracy? We had a little writer's retreat, uh, which the original grand plan was to get a really cool Airbnb and go away for like two weeks, a la Mary Shelley, and it did result in the end in us doing <laughs> One night at a micro hotel, uh, mapping out a, a book, but it was great. It was really. It great. was really fun, and <laughs> it's it's hilarious to me that you and I did a writers retreat because we write every week. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. As if this was the thing that made us finally stop being distracted and actually start writing for once. <laughs> oh my god, we were finally we write so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. But here's the thing. Mm -hmm. We're working on something. We're working on a thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do we do they do we say? We yeah, can I feel say. Like we, we said it in the live, you know, for those who are at our TikTok live during our writers okay. retreat. Yeah. We're we're working on the full on book that is yep. coming from The Wizard and the Rogue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess, I guess to to be a little bit clear, it is not The Wizard and the Rogue. It is. But it's not not. It's the not Wizard not the Wizard and the Rogue. It's so, actually very much the Wizard and the Rogue. It is. It is. We just changed the name of it. Yeah, because there's no rogue. <laughs> there's no rogue. The whole time we keep calling her an assassin. And and Roslyn is an assassin, for those who know the story of, of the Wizard and the Rogue that we have been crafting so far on the show. <laughs> um, we're expanding it. We're really expanding into a full story. And it's... Got a new title, but that might change too, much like everything yeah, with the story. Of course. It's so it's been so fun working on it and having two brains come together to craft what it's gonna be. Thank God. Thank God. Thank the Lord, whoever <laughs> they are of a creativity that we have two brains. I don't know how people do it with one solo brain. I don't either. Because here's the thing when you're writing. And this is something I come to terms with a lot as we do our podcast. Hmm. When you're writing and you write your characters or your story where the people are in this tricky situation they need to think their way out of, guess who also has to be smart enough to get them out of it? I know. It's it's <laughs> troublesome. Like, I have to be the most clever person in the story. I have to be the least clever person in the story. I have to solve the problems. I have to create the problems. Like, how do people do it on their own? Well, on the writer's retreat, we were solving a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. And I kind of expected going into that that I would just be like, but the characters and their feelings. And you'd be like, but the plot and what's happening. And that isn't how it went no. down. We both no. were just back and forth lightning round in it to win it. Yeah. Get yourself a writing partner who who you can just they'll, – they'll come up with an idea and then you'll be like, okay. And you challenge it with a thought and they're like, oh, okay. And they think more. And there's just no defensiveness with us. It was like – no idea was a bad idea, and there was so much inherent trust between us that yeah. we just were like tennis court, like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, there was no moment where I was too embarrassed to say something, even if I objectively knew what I was going to say wasn't great because mm -hmm. I wanted you to hear what I was thinking because I knew it would help. Yeah, yeah, so – that was really fun. Tracy and I are two halves of one whole, and that whole is this podcast. Hi, I'm Rowan Hall. Hi, I'm Tracy Harrison. And this is Willing and Fable, the podcast that brings you original retellings and in-depth research on the history, mystery, and mythology that makes the world so fascinating. Each week, we research a topic from history or mythology, and then we write an original story to go along with that topic. So if you'd like to support our show, think about giving us a review. It's a really great way to help other new people find our show, and we really, really appreciate you taking the time to spread the word about our podcast. You can also shop our very cool new merch, Jamie yes. Harrison, Fly Robot Fly, everywhere on the social media. Joined us for an episode on the Statue of David and the Mona Lisa just before mm -hmm. this, and we had so many people ask for hot David merch. 
And Jamie delivered. We've got Mm -hmm. Mona Lisa. We've got my sweet boy Achilles. We've got Hot David. It's all Y2K vaporwave designs. We have been sitting on these for so long. We're so happy to share them with you. You can find those pieces and all the rest of our merch at willingandfable.com. Or you can support our show by going through your house hanging bats, orange lights, skeletons, cobwebs, and candles, and pretty much anything else you can think of to decorate for Halloween, because it is spooky season, baby! Baby! (laughs) But no matter what you do, we are glad to have you here with us today. My favorite thing that you do is give me just like a little smile when I do a good transition. Um... (laughs) So, everyone, my transition today was good, I know, because Tracy gave me the little smile. But more importantly, it is spooky season. I just interrupted that really good transition. <laughs> <laughs> it was okay. It was to, to be very charming. So, you can always interrupt a good transition to be very charming. The hype. The mutual yes. hype. Yes. It's Halloween. It's the most wonderful time of the year. But hey, if you're not goth, you probably think the most wonderful time of the year is Christmas or the holiday season. And... If you are that person, have you started holiday shopping? We are so pleased to announce that Greenleaf Geek is releasing adventure calendars this year. They're like the chocolate-filled advent calendars, but uh, they're a lot better because these are stuffed with a ton of nerdy goodies. There are 24 compartments. They're filled with TTRPG-themed surprises. We have our own coming for the holidays. Mm -hmm. Of course, Tracy and I are most excited for the four full sets of dice that Leah curates, but there's also Mm -hmm. a ton of surprises that we don't know about yet. We have a special code for Willing and Fable listeners to shop the Green Leaf Geek Adventure Calendars. Use Fable Advent, that's F-A-B-L-E-A-D-V-E-N-T, no spaces, and you get $5 off your order. And definitely shop soon because they always, always sell out. And if you want to shop the rest of the store, don't forget to use our code FABLE, that's F-A-B-L-E, for 10% off your order. Some restrictions apply. All right. What are we talking about today? Today, I am covering the unknown woman of the Sen. I think this has been on your to-do list since season one. Since season one, yes, I... Oh my god, the feelings that I have about this episode are so intense, and my script got so long that I was like, hey, Trace, uh, (laughs) two-part episode? And I said always. I said yes, always. More info. I love it. Let's do it. Yeah, you didn't even hesitate, and- Not once. I was very enthusiastic about opening up Spooky Season with this, so mm-hmm. thank you. I have been waiting. Um, this episode's also very much for my mother. My mm-hmm. mother is obsessed with the Unknown Woman of the Sen. She introduced me to her, and I inherited that obsession. <laughs> I'm so excited. So before we go into today's episode, a quick content warning. The episode will include much discussion of death, drowning, and suicide, and some of the people in this true and morbid history were quite young. Listener discretion is, as always, advised. This is the story of the most kissed woman in the world. I have kissed her more than once. Tracy, I know you have kissed her. Very likely, listener, you have kissed her too. And if not, you know someone who has. Probably many someones. You are only ever one degree of separation away from this girl, no matter where you are in the world or who you are with. That is the most insane opening to an episode we've ever had. I am so excited. I have no idea what that means. (laughs) <laughs> so I want everyone, like Tracy, to remember that moving forward. <laughs> okay, there is something about the beginning of October, and I think, Tracy, you've heard me use this phrase, but I don't know if I've ever explained it, but I call this period the something wicked this way comes, period. Oh, we both do. Yes, yes. There, the, the, There's just a uh, – there's an extra feeling in the air that's like – for me, it's a cross between – nostalgia and 
excitement for this like looming something. Yes, yes. And for me, it also has this very real, very savory kind of existential horror mixed in with the candies and the costumes. Like the leaves are falling and spring is fading away. And I think there's this feeling in our animal brains of like, everything will die and I will die too one day. But it's delicious. Yeah. <laughs> it, it It's not to be like so stereotypical but like it is a hosier thing like the whole that yeah. same vibe that, that there's that energy not to say that hosier and like autumn are tied in my mind but that y- he is of, like, he he is he oh listen I, I am exactly the person you would think would be like a huge hosier fan you know everyone decided florence of florence and the machine florence welsh is mm-hmm. a seely fae and hosier yes. is an unseely fae and they must come together and make music i would honestly flip it it's interesting that that I would see Florence as unseely. She's got a little bit more of the like might drown you energy. Yeah, but I feel like Seely Fay would drown you. They just like look all pretty and flowy while they do it. Hozier like kind of has like I've been off in the bog for a few weeks. <laughs> uh-huh. I just came out looking like weirdly dashing, but like I've been away. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. This is a discussion you and I will genuinely have off podcast later. <laughs> oh, for sure. So so to explain what the heck Tracy and I are talking about, I am going to quote Ray Bradbury's Something Wicked This Way Comes, which was a foundational book for the two of us. For some, autumn comes early, stays late through life where October follows September and November touches October, and then instead of December and Christ's birth, There is no Bethlehem star, no rejoicing, but September comes again, and old October, and so on down the years, with no winter, spring, or revivifying summer. For these beings, fall is the ever-normal season, the only weather, there be no choice beyond. Where do they come from? The dust. Where do they go? The grave. Does blood stir in their veins? No, the night wind. What ticks in their head? The worm. What speaks from their mouth? The toad. What sees from their eye? The snake. What hears from their ear? The abyss between the stars. They sift the human storm for souls, eat flesh of reason, fill tombs with sinners. They frenzy forth, in gusts they beetle scurry, creep thread, filter motion, make all moons sullen, and surely cloud all clear-run waters. The spiderweb hears them, trembles, breaks. Such are the autumn people. Beware of them. I love that quote. It's so good. It's so <laughs> good. So I'm, I'm kicking off Spooky Season. I couldn't necessarily tell you. Hopefully I can tell you by the end. But that quote came into my head while I was writing this episode. Okay. Okay. That's helpful to know. It is Paris in the 1850s. And Emperor Napoleon III, and I know what you're thinking, mm-hmm. he was the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. Okay. Thank you. He was on a mission to turn Paris into a modern metropolis. No more winding, narrow streets. There would be broad boulevards and even, gasp, underground sewers. (gasps) In this world, the city became walkable. Department stores sprung up and people are welcomed, no, encouraged to just pop into stores for a look. The culture of looking is born along with the new word, flanery, the new pastime of strolling around aimlessly and ideally looking good while you're doing it. Ooh, love that. We enter my story here. The year is 1864, and there is a brand new theater in Paris. It's a modern building constructed just behind the Notre Dame. It's free and open every day of the week. Street vendors flock nearby to sell fruit, nuts, and little snacks. Newspaper headlines are barked to passersby, and all manner of street performers and beggars flock to the crowds. There's a line of locals and tourists stretching out the door and around the building as far as anyone can imagine and still further. As many as 40,000 thousand people will file through this 
famous exhibition hall to gawk, chatter, whisper. This is what the British tour books called Le Musée de la Mort, the brand new Paris morgue. So they let people, just everyday people, come into the morgue? Oh, girl. Oh, because I know, I know morgues used to be like a a big display thing of, you know, you go watch the autopsies, but I thought that was only doctors and people studying to become doctors, not just like people. Oh, oh, but there (laughs) will be people. I, okay. Here, visitors, people off the street can look at half naked, decaying corpses laid out on slabs behind a massive viewing window. Now, The official purpose of an exhibition hall in the morgue was so that the public could help the city identify the unclaimed dead bodies, many of whom washed up on the banks of the Seine. At the time, two-thirds of the corpses that arrived at the morgue were pulled from the Seine. Two-thirds? Yeah. Accidental drownings, suicides, murders. That's so many for one place. That's just... That's just insane to process. It's it's so many. Throughout this story, anytime there's a number, it's going to just be so many more than you okay. think is appropriate. <laughs> okay, okay. What's more, this new morgue had nicer facilities. It was much larger than its predecessor. It was centrally located and designed for visitors. It had autopsy rooms, a laundry, a discreet rear entrance for corpses, a registrar and staff. It was not overrun with rats. Always a plus. The Guardian writes, quote, when the British director Peter Greenaway made an eerie documentary, Le Mort de la Seine, retelling the tales of 23 drownings between 1795 and 1801, he learned that young women made up the biggest portion of apparent suicides, appearing to favor drowning while men opted for hanging. The true stories he recreated included bizarre findings, such as a naked woman in her 70s, dredged from the Seine, clasping two leeks in her left hand. Hmm. Vanessa Schwartz, a professor at the University of Southern California and author of Spectacular Realities, Early Mass Culture in Fin de Siquel, Paris, points out, Coming to the morgue was a show, like reality TV or true crime today. Tracy, this image is from an excellent article by David Roos for How Stuff Works called In 19th Century Paris, The Morgue Was the Best Show in Town. Whoa. Okay, so this is a um, ink and pencil sketch. It's a black and white drawing of people in front of this huge floor-to-ceiling window in which on the bottom are a bunch of bodies lined up, it looks like, on display. And all of their clothes hanging above them. Mm -hmm. And people, uh, some people looking in at the bodies, other people just kind of wandering around or talking to each other. There are a lot more pictures that show more crowds and more like people's reactions, more drawings. But I wanted to pick this one because it has kind of the widest image of Mm. what the space actually looked like. So on the way in. Billboards and posters advertised the current corpses to the visitors who were ushered in single file. There was a massive plate glass window draped with rich green curtains that only added to the theatricality of the experience. Bodies were laid out on slabs in two rows of six, with their belongings hanging up nearby exactly like you said. In some cases, bodies were staged more dramatically by posing them together in chairs, as was the case with two young women pulled from the sun together who were believed to be sisters due to similarities in their appearance. I want to sit here and be all highly moral and say, obviously these people had no say in what would happen to their bodies, and to be put on display like this without their consent is not okay. I mean, by our today's standards, this is just not acceptable. And I want to sit here and say, like, this is wrong and this is moral and immoral. And it is. If I were alive in 1864 and this was, you know, in my town, I was in Paris, I probably would be in line just like all these other people. Yeah. I, in part two, we're definitely going to dive into the morals a little bit more. And we could definitely get up on a high horse and kind of like virtue signal about it, mm-hmm. I think. 
But the fact of the matter is we have to deal with death. We have to as Mm -hmm. people. And sweeping it under the rug is not better. Is displaying bodies for people to like laugh and gawk at the solution? No. No. But I think swinging the other way isn't the solution either. This is clearly a very distressed response to a distressing time. Yeah. And to imply that it's to imply that it's so different from our interest in true crime today is, I think, frankly, a little irresponsible. I think people have always been fascinated by death and have always been interested in it. And it, this, it, it's like you said, this is clearly a very um, extreme response, but I think there is a world in which a version of this could exist today in our society. I think people have always been people and we do messed up stuff all the time, which just changing how we do it. Yeah, actually, uh, the Ologies podcast has a really great episode about death. It's their Thanatology episode with Cole Imperi, uh, and it was actually re-released. And Ali Ward is pretty transparent about it being maybe one of the best episodes they've ever done. And in it, Cole talks about how so okay it is to be obsessed with death. Yeah, I love the Ologies podcast. If you guys have not listened to it, please check it out. This is a free plug. The reason I'm so obsessed with bats, straight up, Chiropterology episode. <laughs> but yeah, when people like to moralize about true crime, it, people are obsessed with things that are scary. That's just how humans are. And mm-hmm. we can do it in better ways than I guess I hope that we strive to. But also, looking back on people being messed up, we don't need to really spend any time sitting around going, that's messed up. Because it just is. Like, mm-hmm. what are we going to say about it that needs to be said at all? Yeah. And that's kind of how I feel going into this episode and how I feel sort of about like Memento Mori and things like that in general. It is so fascinating to see people's fascination. Mm -hmm. And I myself am very interested in death and kind of the culture that surrounds it. So looking back on past times when it was just world dark Mm -hmm. (laughs) is Mm -hmm. more interesting than – my need to distance myself from it is. Like, I I feel more intrigued than I feel the need to be like, "Mm, I'm too good. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's pretty clear in in the things that we cover. And I think in the way that we cover it, it's definitely I'm growing more towards that. But I have always been interested in the way that we – you've always been interested in the way that we as a a society think about death. And I've been interested in the way that we as a society think about each other. Mm-hmm. And you can kind of see that in the way that we explore this this topic. But anyway, back to the Paris morgue in the 1860s. So here's the the thing that's actually, for some reason, darkest to me. Though in 1882, they were able to install state-of-the-art refrigeration units that could preserve corpses for weeks. Previous to that, cold water would drip on bodies to keep them fresh. That little detail, it just does me in. Do you think the glass did enough to prevent the smell? I don't know. And I've thought a lot about the smell. And actually, I looked up information about what death smells like. Distinct notes of licorice, uh, citrus, but not like yummy citrus, like uh, that awful smell of like fake sprayed citrus. And also sour white wine, but amped up to the max with fish. You're welcome, everyone. I want everyone to know that Rowan didn't read that off everything. That was in her head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes, that is who I am. Okay. So even with refrigeration, audience wanted to see corpses longer than the rate of decay would allow. Lucky for them, alongside this macabre practice of viewing corpses, wax museums were appearing as another example of this, quote, spectacle of the real. Mm Mm-hmm. Wax museums depicted historical figures, but also events from newspaper headlines. Many of our listeners may have heard of graphic crime scenes being turned into exhibitions at wax museums during the Victorian era. Uh, That's because it's a common playground for, like, period TV shows to get a jump scare. That happened, and it was punk rock as heck. I Again, I want to virtue signal of, like, you shouldn't do – I would go see that today. Yeah. So at the morgue, 
the corpses that drew the biggest crowds were women and children. The newspapers would publish the presence of a particularly untimely death and thousands of people would flock. David Roos writes for that article for How Stuff Works that within the morgue, quote, children would be dressed in nice clothes and propped in a chair close to the glass. If the police apprehended a suspect, they would march the alleged murderer down to the morgue and stage a public confrontation with the corpse, hoping that the sight of the victim would force a confession. Michael Waters for Atlas Obscura writes, quote, In 1888, the Paris morgue installed electric lights. With the idea of increasing the effect produced upon murderers upon being confronted with their victims, under the effect of the lights, the confrontations are expected to be much more effective. This tactic actually worked. Paris police records list several instances of suspects who, after initially refusing to cooperate, confess their crimes upon visiting the morgue. End quote. There's so much to process there. So they would publicly bring suspects in front of all the other visitors and make a whole big show? Because, mm-hmm. like, that, I, I think, has some issues. That- it has exactly as many issues as, like, the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial. Absolutely. It has exactly as many issues as all of the circus rigmarole that is always going on. Yep. Again, I keep, it's so interesting talking about these stories where you want to be like, these people back in those times were so uh, callous and maybe they were dumb or they were not as sophisticated as us, but... <laughs> We've always been people. People have always had reasons for doing what they do. And like I said before, the way they do it just changes. You take this morgue, translate it into the viral crime dramas, Casey Anthony, all of these things we see today, and it's the same thing. Yeah, 100%. The most famous bodies, or celebrity corpses, were replaced with wax copies when decomposition demanded. For example... The, quote, woman cut into two pieces was a body retrieved from the Seine in 1876. She was exhibited at the morgue and replaced with a wax figure after two weeks due to her popularity. Between 300 and 400,000 people eventually came to see the spectacle, especially because the wax form seemed so uncannily realistic. By the 1870s, photography was utilized when bodies had decayed too much to display, but even so, there is at least one instance that a misidentified corpse was brought back after substantial deterioration, and that, again, drew an even bigger crowd. Wait, so it was misidentified as, like, it was, you know, this is Jane Doe, but really it was Sarah Doe. Yeah, so someone said it was Jane Doe, and they buried it or started the process of interring it and they're like oh no that wasn't right so then they brought the body back out because you know it was misidentified maybe someone will identify it right slash you know publicity wow wow here is a description of the paris morgue from the novel therese raquin written by emile zola and published in 1867 quote The morgue is a sight within reach of everybody, and one to which passers-by, rich and poor alike, treat themselves. The door stands open, and all are free to enter. There are admirers of the scene who go out of their way so as not to miss one of these performances of death. If the slabs have nothing on them, visitors leave the building disappointed, feeling as if they had been cheated, and murmuring between their teeth. But when they are fairly well occupied, people crowd in front of them and treat themselves to cheap emotions. They express horror, they joke, they applaud or whistle, as at the theater, and withdraw satisfied, declaring the morgue a success on that particular day. In contrast, a Harvard University student wrote this after their visit in 1885, quote, An eager throng is surging to and fro in front of a long, low window. Men are crowding and elbowing each other. Old hags are pointing toward the glass and croaking to one another. Pretty women are gazing with white faces of pity, but with nonetheless thirsty greediness upon some fascinating spectacle. Little children are being held aloft in strong arms that they too may see the dreadful thing. And they do see and they toss their tiny wavering arms aloft and crow right gleefully. 
The objects of interest are four corpses, which are lying upon iron frameworks behind the glass, their heads propped high, their jaws agape, and their eyes staring in all the grim majesty of death as they gaze unflinchingly upon the guests who are thronging to this grisly reception. There's so much there. (laughs) I am very interested in the fact that in that quote, everywhere I saw it published, death was capitalized. Capital D, death. Their eyes staring in all the grim majesty of death. Yeah, I think for a long time, death was always talked about as a figure more Mm -hmm. than we do today as a concept. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll get into that actually just slightly more in a second. But Tracy, you're you're 100% correct. The Victorians loved their death, capital D. Mm -hmm. The Paris Morgues Exhibition Hall was closed in 1907 over concerns for citizens, quote, moral hygiene. Specifically, the powers that be feared women's voyeurism and the effect that so many naked male bodies would have on the women of Paris. That and children were invited to go see the dead bodies. So, you know, nakedness. Yeah, nakedness was the problem there. Actually, I don't even think death is the problem there. I don't think... To me, the problem there is that the people who are dead did not consent to being put on display, but... You know, I think of the bodies exhibition that's all across the world today where people donate their bodies to science and then those bodies are in the exhibition. How is that so different than this? Right. I mean, consent, I guess, is one of those things. Um, And you, well, okay, here's the thing. In America today, you do have to consent before people can do anything with your dead body. Mm -hmm. But we don't really have a lot of consent issues with women wanting to do things with their alive body. Hint, hint, hint. So, (laughs) you know, how much do you really need your body when you're dead? Right. I'm not religious, so I think not at all. Right. (laughs) But that's me. No, I I am someone who has, you know, organ donor. I would love to donate my body to science. I know many people in my family feel the same way. I think my mom wants her body to be turned into a tree, like turned into fertilizer and you grow a tree and you plant the tree there. Like, Actually, that's a thing and it has been weighing on me a lot recently. If you do want anything specific to happen to your body, especially donating it somewhere, figure that out right now and, and get it in writing and mm-hmm. get your will set up because you could die. Or you will die one day, and if you haven't done it, it will never happen. Mm -hmm. You will just be ashes or a box or whatever. So yeah, if you don't want to be exhibited at the Paris morgue. (laughs) (laughs) Or if you do. Or if you do, right? In their article, The Paris Morgue as a Social Institution in the 19th Century, Alana Mitchell describes this culture of looking as a positive force. The crowds that flocked to the Paris morgue helped to revolutionize policing and forensic medicine. Exactly what I described with that very shiny new morgue with all the fun new gadgets and photography and electric lights. Mm -hmm. Like much media, the theatrics may have functioned as a way to appease the masses, provide dark entertainment, and possibly point people to the greater enemy of death, capital D, to appease impoverished groups that may otherwise have been inclined to become more politically engaged. Mm. As we discussed in our Memento Mori episode, much though not all Victorian culture in England, across Europe, obviously France, and the surrounding areas were obsessed with death. Um, Not only that, but the idea of arriving at a, quote, good death, which is where you slip away peacefully surrounded by friends and family. Mm -hmm. The Paris morgue functioned as a look into bad death, where one can end up if they're vulnerable and alone. Not only that, but it took death from a place of private religious contemplation into urban secularized culture. People create rituals around death the world over, and this is just one look at the way a society can attempt to defang death, capital D, and make it into another maybe horrifying but maybe humorous part of life. And if we look at this in kind of cohort with industrialization and modernization and urbanization, mm-hmm. it's, it's very clear the way people are trying to extract something so large Uh, from being purely the domain of the religious. 
One contemporary writer said, The morgue has been the first this year among theaters to announce its closing. As for the spectators, they have no right to say anything because they didn't pay. The show being always free, there were no subscribers, only regulars. It was the first free theater for the people. And they tell us it's being canceled. People, the hour of social justice has not yet arrived. I can't tell if this person is mad or happy that it's closing. They're, they're, they're like, people can't be mad because they didn't pay. But also, this was a free theater for the people and now they're canceling it. How dare they? Uh, yes and, I think. (laughs) Yeah, yes, I think it's just all things in one. (laughs) And this is the world that our leading lady was born into in death. Okay. She is called L'Inconnue de la Seine, the unknown woman of the Seine, La Belle Noyée, the beautiful drowned, the drowned Mona Lisa, as <laughs> Albert Camus would later say, but no name yet. Okay. So I'm going to give you now my story. It's a dreary, wet night when they bring her in. There's nothing noteworthy about it. The night always seems filled with rain, or it's just rained, or the streets could really use a good rain. You hardly notice anymore amongst the constant dampness. Drip. 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 One man on the stretcher comments on how eerie it is coming into the morgue at night. He must be new. No one who comes by often, especially during the private hours, would say anything so absurd. That would be asking for one of the boys to give them a real scare. You think, next time the newcomer turns a corner empty-handed, you'll toss a body into him. You peer around at the slabs. There's an old woman in a particular state of deepening decay. They'll retire her tomorrow, maybe. If you can be quick about it, you could catch him on his way out. One push and he'll be forced to embrace the hag in a macabre waltz. She'll squelch into him like a too-ripe tomato. You put the idea aside. Between the two men, slumped into the stiffness of the stretcher, is a young woman. Perfect, you think. A crowd will come for this one. They go to lay her out on a free slab, but you stop them. The new man is confused, but the other one knows the score. He helps you to move some bearded fellow's body off to the side so that this woman may recline front and center for the crowd's view. If you weren't shuffling under the weight of a decaying corpse... You'd have a spring in your step. When the doctor comes in the morning, he'll be so pleased. You'll have her prepared, thorough notes compiled. He'll be so invigorated by this new specimen. He'll be so pleased with your work. He won't accuse you of looming when you peer over his shoulder at his tidy cuts. You're so lost in your daydream, you forget about your prank on the new man, whose name you did not ask. Ah, what a waste of a good rotter. You nod your forehead at the putrid woman in the back, but this you say aloud. You have a habit of striking up conversation only with the freshest corpses, the ones that seem most eager to listen. So you know she's a good one, this new lady on the slab. You get to work quickly. Where once your fingers trembled in fear, they now only shiver in anticipation. Working nights has its perks after all. Plenty of time to work and study, and no one around to hurry, no clamoring crowds. Her dress, buttoned up to the neck, is matted with mud. The banks of the Seine work quickly to entomb the dead, and she is well encased. While you undress her, you think, How can dead women be so heavy? The live ones must have some inner bounce to them, or how else is anyone getting their knickers down for any fun? You're sure this must be so, but I've never been with a lady, you say. You're too young. Well, that depends on who you ask. Doc says, no, you're too old not to have wet your wick. Drip, drip, drip. With her clothing heaped for the morning laundress, you set to work with clean water to wash. You've a notebook off to the side to annotate anything you see. The doctor likes that you do that. You write down everything you find, usually bruising, sometimes a broken bone. Occasionally there's a stab wound, or someone died with a possession locked in an iron grip. You never note any money you find in their pockets. 
If someone is senseless enough to die with their purse, if someone is crazed enough to murder without stealing, it only makes sense that the money ought to go to you. You note nothing. She is clean, unblemished, still soft to the touch, though cold. The water has not saturated her into bloating. She's so pristine you imagine she might sit up at any moment. And then you clean her face. Oh, God. The mass of mud and hair a crime scene unto itself, but beneath, bless, she is whole. More than that, she is beautiful. The face is the only time you let yourself look, really look, for a bit of humanity within a corpse. Here it is, lad. Humanity locked in death. Drip. Locked in quiet. Drip. Locked in bliss. The woman, no, the girl, she cannot be older than you, a year or two, one way or the other. Lord, will she draw a crowd being that young, looking like that. You are struck by the crushing urge to cover this girl. You nearly slip in the puddle of the sen you've washed from her. The morgue has cloth to cover the unseemly bits. You do, but that's not enough. Look at her smile. You brush away a clinging hair, and right there, in the quirked corners of her full lips, there is a smile. You've never seen the dead look pleased with their state. You've seen a few come in looking distinctly terrified, but she's lying in the morgue, smiling as if she were only out for a summertime swim, like she might open her eyes at any moment and laugh a bell-chime giggle at you for staring so long. Drip, your eyes are wet. Now she looks as if she has one single tear streaking down her cheek. You curse. You apologize for your language. Then you scurry off to get the water running. You should have done it sooner. The steady dripping of cold water is what keeps bodies fresher, longer. There are minutes of your time with her lost because you let her rot while you dallied. The thought consumes you. Drip. Drip. You check her face often to see if so long out of the river is already forcing the expression away. Soon her smile will slide off her skull with so much skin. Supple now, but for how long? They'll leave her out until she's mad with death. They'll dress her up, sit her in the display chair, press her as close as the glass will allow, and she will fall into malice. That which turned her smile up will pull her down beneath the laughter of every passing fool. And what if her eyes fall open and she sees them gawking? If you wait until morning... The doctor's death mask will only capture her face's laxity. Then she'll be a drowned woman. You return to the girl with the plaster. I've never done this before, you say. She lies beneath you and smiles. Thank God you were here for her. Please, God, let this go well. Oh, God, what are you doing? You tidy her hair like you've seen your mother do. You think the girl will like this. You cover her in grease, tender little pets across flower petal skin. Do not wake and see that you are dead, you whisper, so quiet. She looks so pleased, you know, you know she is on the precipice, alive and happy within her closed eyes until she falls and realizes she is dead. Laying the plaster strips across her face feels very much like tucking the girl into bed or dressing her in armor. While you work, you sing a children's song you didn't know you remembered. It's about a long sea journey. When the food on the ship runs out, a child draws the short straw and they're all going to eat him. He is saved when the fish begin to jump onto the ship. They fry them up and the song begins again. When you are quiet, your song is taken up by the drip, drip, drip. You wait for the plaster to dry. 
and think that this small stream of water on her body may be the last thread keeping her floating blissfully in the sen. When I take off the mask, you lean close to her. Your face will move. Your eyes will flutter open just a bit, and your smile will fall. I want to tell you, before you wake up, before you realize that you're dead, before everyone comes to gawk at your deadness, before they say you have no name and yours goes missing and no one names you, I just want to tell you, I think you were very loved. You press your lips to the plaster where you think her lips may be. The plaster presses down on the drowned girl. It moves her smile. You cannot see, but the right corner quirks up just a little bit more within the cast. You do not speak. You do not sing. You sit and wait. And when it is dry, you remove the mask to see that the drowned girl is dead. You tuck her in with the two flimsy sheets of the morgue. She does not smile at you when you go. She is gone, the last of her living, trapped in a death mask between the press of two lips. She smiles less and less each day until there are no more days. Drip. One night, they take her rotten body away. Drip. The next morning, there is a new drowned girl at the morgue. Drip. Whew. First of all, writing in second person is such a cool choice for this. And then second of all, there were so many lines in that that just really struck me. Like, specifically the please don't wake up and realize you're dead was so powerful. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to make it second person because I knew in this story that everyone listening would moralize mm. and kind of give themselves credit for wherever they fall. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I would never. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would never. There's so much I would never in this story. And I think that's absolutely absurd in most cases. <laughs> and mm -hmm. If you really are going to say, you know, I'm, I'm too virtuous to have participated in death in this way, I want it to be like a clear decision. And I think that the best way to do that is to put someone in this scenario, especially because everything that comes after this story is based in the fact as it is told, that someone saw this dead woman and thought she was so beautiful, they had to make a death mask. So that's real? We think. Depending wow. on who's telling it, there's maybe a very different version of this story. But the story of L'Inconnu de la Seine is that a woman came to the morgue, and she was so beautiful, and she was smiling, and she looked serene, and they had to. They just had to capture it. Maybe it was the physician. Maybe it was the attendant. And then no one names her. And she's buried in a pauper's grave. And this mask goes on to hang in the homes of artists and famous people and in art studios and classrooms. And just countless people are inspired by this face of this one dead girl. And no one knows who she was. Did anyone even try to find out who she was? Well, I mean, in theory, yes, because she was put up in the morgue and that right. was the deal at the time, right? Like, hey, right. here's this dead girl. Figure it out. If you know her, tell us. But no one did. Wow. And then there's the story, you know, she was, she was blemishless. She was perfect. Did she have a lover's quarrel and, and she died? Roughly how old is she? 16. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Experts think that because of the fullness of her face and the suppleness of her skin, that she could not have been more than 19 years old. Wow. That's so young. So I have the death mask for you to look at. 
This is the most famous picture of okay. L'Inconnu de la Seine. This looks like a child. This looks like someone very young. Uh, it is a... It, it looks like the photograph of a person's face. It's a black and white image. Um, and it's an image of the death mask, but because it's black and white, you can't necessarily tell that. Just like described on uh, the left side of the image, but her right side of her face, it's quirked up a little bit, like she's smiling, her eyes are closed, her hair is parted down the middle, kind of pressed against her her head as if it was tied back at the nape of the neck. Um, you know, she's, she's a lovely girl, uh, so young, truly I would think like 14 maybe. Yeah, she's really young looking. And I don't have any context for whether everyone was like, yep, this is how young she is, or because she became this mask, she could just become whatever anyone looking at her needed. She is the longtime muse of so many people we're going mm. to learn. And in being unknown, she can become anything. So – in the article, How Death Masks Work for How Stuff Works, Aaron Wright says of basically the story I just told you, quote, if this story sounds a little fantastic, that's because it probably is. The woman supposedly drowned, which bloats the body and the face before anyone would see her floating. Water, depending on temperature, also may accelerate the decomposition process, but the face of this anonymous woman is peaceful and serene. She even has a slight smile like Mona Lisa's. Now, add to the story that her body awaited identification in the morgue for hours, even days, and the nail is almost in the coffin. From what we learned earlier, nothing in this story fits with the biological process of a drowning death and the making of death masks. The final blow to the story is that death masks were only made for the wealthy or famous. This woman has remained anonymous in all likelihood. She was a model. For a life mask. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> so some say that this famous mask, the mm -hmm. one that you were looking at, yeah. was actually cast from the deceased daughter of a German plasterer. So, you know, he would have all the materials and the know-how to cast right. a death mask. Another version states that the daughter of a plaster factory owner in Germany was actually very much alive while copies of her face were being sold in great numbers across Europe. And I like to imagine her just sitting there smug with the thought. Yeah. In his article, How a Dead Girl in Paris Ended Up with the Most Kissed Lips in History for Science Alert, Peter Dockrell writes, Quote, perhaps the dead girl was indeed the original basis of the mask, but the features were intentionally molded into a more aesthetically pleasing visage after the imprint was taken, so as to disguise the blemish of drowning and death. There might also be a hybrid possibility somewhere in the middle. The inconnu posed for the molder when she was alive, and only later drowned herself, at which point the mask became famous and a legend grew around it. She could have just been a model. Okay. I like that answer better. Yeah. Pediatrician and educator Megan Phelps from the University of Sydney's School of Medicine traveled to Paris as part of her research for L'Inconnu. She said to Science Alert, quote, The challenges of learning more about her story and her impact as a cultural icon have given her even more significance for me. She has been an enigmatic figure for me, and I have thoroughly enjoyed the figurative and literal journeys on which she has taken me. She adds, quote, I don't think we'll ever know who the young woman was. I suspect she was an artist's model, and her image used to create a mask to be used for drawing copying practice. So is the prevailing theory that she was dead when the mask was taken, or that she was alive? I think the prevailing theory as I read it is exactly kind of how I presented it. Everyone's okay. like, this is the story that everyone's obsessed with, and here are the other options, but there's really no more for us to know. Mm. They, there just isn't. Mm -hmm. It's not like, I don't know, King Tut, where we're going to go and we're going to unearth right. him and figure out how he died. And right. find out about his life. She's gone. Gone, gone. Like, no one even knows where her remains are. 
We don't know who she was in life, but in death, she was someone completely separate from all of it. Right? Her death mask. Right, right. L'inconnu de la Seine, the unknown woman of the Seine, is not the same woman that this girl was when she was alive. Yes. Yeah, completely. Not the least distinction being woman and girl. (laughs) Yeah. So let's talk about death masks because, A, it's interesting, and B, I think one of the reasons she's so transfixing is death masks look like plaster casts of people who died. You can see it very often. Maybe if not the cause of their death, kind of this, I I don't know, having looked at so many death masks, there is just this lacking in a Mm. lot of them. Your, f- mm. your face falls. Your skin is unanimated. The muscles are not participating anymore. Right. And this girl, in many ways probably because she died so young or because she just was a human who was so young, doesn't have that. She is the embodiment of the good death. Like even though oh. she was alone and she drifted down the river, she was right. peaceful and happy, which is why I and then consequently the character that I wrote about just became really interested in this idea of like she just didn't know. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. A death mask, for anyone who has no heckin' clue what on earth we're talking about, is an impression usually made with plaster or wax taken within the first hours after someone's death. Before photography, sculptors and painters could use these death masks as reference materials. Uh, But for many people, they were also memento mori, or items that helped them mourn for and remember their deceased loved ones. Mm -hmm. Again, we talked about in the memento mori episode, wealth comes into play with this. If she was a woman who just came to the morgue, the fact that she had a death mask was because she was so beautiful. Right. Death masks have existed for centuries in various forms. Ancient Egyptians and Romans created them as often elaborate depictions of the deceased, though these were more symbolic depictions rather than the facial castings we're discussing in this episode. The Romans were known to take full wax casts of nobles, including Julius Caesar, whose cast had stab wounds. Wait, how did we lose that? That's amazing. I do not know. (laughs) That's a bummer. I know. <laughs> I think from what I read, it it, it was written about. Mm-hmm. So I, wax, you know, not the most durable. Yeah. Even plaster, not the most durable. If you've seen behind the scenes videos of a major monster movie or a Marvel film, you've probably seen special effects artists making casts of actors' faces to make prosthetics. And this is a modern version, essentially, of the same practice. Right. Technically... It is more similar to casting a life mask, which is the same process done while the subject is alive, a possibility for l'inconnu. Because Abraham Lincoln cast two life masks many years apart, after his death, doctors were able to see evidence of a wasting disease from which he was suffering before his assassination that would have eventually killed him. Wow. In the 19th century, when our story takes place, the pseudoscience of phrenology was taking off. This was the practice of studying someone's head to learn about them, uh, and it was a lot like astrology meets medical science, gets blended with racism, and is composed of absolute lies. Oh, yeah, it's all lies, and it's extremely racist. Nevertheless... The desire to know about the skull shapes of the rich and famous led to the casting of numerous death masks. Beethoven, Chopin, Audubon, Cromwell, Mozart, Napoleon, Nikola Tesla, John Keats, Oliver Cromwell, Max Reinhardt, and others all had death masks. And members of Victorian society might have death masks of loved ones or famous celebrities hanging in their homes Right where someone might put their Live, Laugh, Love poster today. It's not shocking to me at all. And it functioned in essentially the same way as a Live, Laugh, Love poster. We talked about this in Memento Mori, but Live, Laugh, Love is like, seize the day. Be winsome. Go live your life. And Memento Mori are like, hey, you're going to die. Go seize the day. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how is it that different than a poster of someone, like a celebrity that you have in your house today? When you didn't have photography of those people... It's also punk rock. Yeah, it is. (laughs) 
The process of creating a death mask was typically performed by a physician and must be done soon after a person's passing uh, so that the features didn't bloat, fall, or distort. Grease would be applied to the face and hair to protect it and make removal easier. Then plaster bandages mixed with water would be laid on the face. Unlike today's plaster, the drying process would take over an hour, and then the doctor would remove the mold or negative. Lastly, the doctor would pour a substance like wax or bronze into the mold to create the positive three-dimensional mask of the recently deceased. Mm -hmm. Tracy, this is an image of two people actually casting a death mask. So it is a kind of sepia tone black and white image of two men, the man on the left with a snazzy mustache. Um, <laughs> it is snazzy. <laughs> it's in 1908 in New York, so he is like really serving us, 1908. Yes. Oh, hair parted in the middle, kind of quaffed to the sides. What is that like? Is he wearing glasses? Is something tucked behind his ear? I think it's – um, you know the the – tools you use when you're working with clay so that you can like mm -hmm, scrape mm -hmm. and get detail it's like a pencil minus the pencil part yeah 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 so then there's a man on the right who is in an apron with his sleeves rolled up and they have a body in between them uh onto which they are laying out the plaster and the body looks fake because it's covered in grease yeah and the hair looks like a bad wig because yes. it's greased and also dead like, I mean, hair is already dead, of course, when it comes out of your head, but hair gets very lank very quickly when you're not <laughs> being yeah. a live human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can also see a bunch of death masks behind them. Yeah, I think this is a really compelling picture because these two people are just working in earnest. Right, just doing their job. It's just work. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say it, but... That is where I'm going to leave you today. I Oh man, this want is so interesting. To remember as we're thinking about death masks and Lincoln Yu as I described her, think about it over the next week, of course, that she is the most kissed woman in the world and you have kissed her. Yeah, we still haven't explored why that is. Yeah. Why like many of us have apparently kissed her. Yeah, I uh I like it. I like the detail. I like the suspense. Maybe people already know for some. If you're like, if you're me, this is a very like popular, famous story. And if you're right. not me, you're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um. Oh, man. I wanted to present kind of the current time. And then the mm -hmm. next episode is going to be her future life as this death mask. But, okay. you know, I hope you love her a little bit now oh totally i'm fascinated so this was awesome thank you for this part one of our two-part series on the unknown woman of the sen i'm <laughs> i'm so excited i didn't know about like any of this so it's been really fun for me uh thanks for being with me uh happy mm -hmm. spooky season everyone this is all real spooky yes it is real spooky <laughs> stuff <laughs> and before we close out we need you to tell us something good my something good it's also a little bit in a spooky vein. I'm playing mm. a Blades in the Dark campaign right now uh, with uh, Spencer and Sage and our friend Kat um, and M. And uh, Blades is just all vibes. It's so good. You love uh, it. I am like constantly screaming at my TTRPG loving friends that this is the like rules light vibey game that everyone is sleeping on. Everyone, no one, not right? Everyone, everyone knows it. it, right? <laughs> but like, so many D and D players could make the jump to this, and I think because everyone sits around being like, I had to learn so many rules for D and D yeah. or Pathfinder, they like it can be daunting. But there aren't that many rules for this game. I'm playing a character named Alice Atreus. Ooh. She is the daughter of a noble, and her mother was sent to an asylum by her father. And our girl gang, because our characters are all women, are poisoners. Oh, my God. Aqua Tofana energy. I love it. Yes! We were inspired <laughs> by Aqua Tofana. So we have this very cool, basically, like, nightclub in this world where we sell all sorts of potions, but... But one of the things we sell is also aqua tofana. Oh, I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. TTRPGs, baby. Mm -hmm. All right, Tracy, tell me something good. 
Um, my something good is that I've started reading Nona the Night, so oh. no spoilers, um, but I'm really enjoying it so far. It is the third in the Gideon, the Ninth, Hair of the Ninth, and now Nona the Ninth tr- trilogy. There might be a fourth one. I'm not sure, but... Oh, is there? I love a trilogy. I don't want it. I haven't done that much research into it because I don't want to spoil anything, but it's been so fun so far and um, really enjoying it. And I just love Tamsin Muir's writing, so... I just got my copy. I just started. I'm only in the first couple chapters, but it's very funny this is no spoilers for the book. Reading the jacket, very purposefully, you can tell that they wanted you to be like, wait, what is this book the same series? What is going on? Like, it's hilarious. It feels like you're getting trolled, but in a yeah. way that you're like, yes, give me more. I love you. Yes. Yeah. So, Nona the Ninth, that is my something good. And thank you all for joining us today. And remember that stories grow with the telling. So if you like what we do, tell a friend. Or tell a foe. And we'll see you soon, okay? Thank you so much for joining us for the Willing and Fable podcast. This episode was written and produced by Tracy Harrison and Rowan Hall. That's me. Our logo is by Jamie Harrison and our music is by Taylor Ash. If you ever want to watch or read what we're reading, head over to willingandfable.com for our show notes and custom merch, or find us at Willing and Fable on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok to join the discussion. We hope you'll rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast using your favorite listening source. And check out Willing and Fable on Patreon, where we have more than a few surprises for you, including custom artwork, stories, and access to our secret Discord channel. And of course, join us next time for another round of original retellings and in-depth research on the history, mystery, and mythology that makes the world so fascinating. do you think you can talk about death on a podcast before they depodcast you <laughs> at least one more at least one more <laughs> just one more a minimum minimum <laughs> minimum 90 more episodes 90 more 90 <laughs>